Exhibition of a series of exhibitions on Santiago Boase, uh, titled uh, Santiago Boase, a painter, magician. That phrase is uh, lifted from a CV of, uh, of Santiago Boase for uh, the uh, 13 Artist Award in 1976. And I think it uh, <clears throat> aptly captures the practice of uh, Boase, both as a, uh, as a painter, uh, initially and later as a magician broadly conceived. And um, uh, we also would like to acknowledge the presence of Peggy Bosse. Peggy, can you please? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the kids, And the kids of Lil, uh, Ja and uh, Kaya, please. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is uh, the first exhibition of uh, Santiago Bosse painter magician uh, aims to uh, introduce uh, the public to the extensive practice of Santiago Bosse. So this is a bit of uh, Santiago Bosse 101 this this afternoon, and uh, I was thinking I think I was thinking that it might be productive to. Uh, talk about uh, the basic matrix, the basic matrix that enabled Santiago to uh, produce forms creatively and also to engage uh, his social environment uh, critically. So I prepared some questions for Lil and uh, like a good daughter, uh, Lil uh, uh, diligently and uh, I'm sure lovingly prepared a uh, PowerPoint presentation to uh, to address these questions. These are very basic questions that will take us to the uh, to the heart of uh, uh, Santi's uh, art. So the first question was, uh, how did Santiago Bose respond to the world around him? What was his general attitude towards the materials of this world? And this question leads to the question of artistic translation. Where, uh, where and how did uh, he look for these materials? And what was the uh, intuition or impulse involved in the process of transforming these materials into art? And then the final question also has something to do with art itself. And the question is, what sort of promise uh, do you think did art uh, Hold out for Santi. So these questions uh, uh, were pitched to Lil, and she sorted them out and produced this PowerPoint uh, to address them. So I now turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. So it's all about since I've been here, my voice has been like. My dad's voice. Ah. <laughs> uh, so he was born July 25, 1949, in Baguio City. He was um, the son of working class parents. His dad was a policeman. His mom was, uh, she had a stall in the market that um, sold wood carvers. Crafts like uh, or wood carvings, you know, like native wood carvings. So, so don don niya parang na recognize it na value yung <clears throat> indigenous um, indigenous work. Uh, he saw it firsthand. He saw it so then commodified um, at the back market. So he also grew up, you know, Baguio at the time had John here. You know, it was basically in the shadow of John Hay, which was an R&R &R 
base for the Americans. And so there was a lot, you know, they were, they had American music, they had American goods, they ate American goods, they used American goods. A lot of them knew English better than they did Tagalog because they were just exposed to so much Western culture. So, but at the same time, <clears throat> um, Dunya na realized na parang in in Baguio, uh, niya report siya sa John Hay kailangan niya kita ng ID or some stuff sila when they just wanted to go in into the camp when you know it's in his country. He's like, why am I being other in my own city in my own country? So parang dun na dun talaga ng parang nadelineate yung ideas niya of um, Filipino identity versus or vis-a-vis -vis Western culture or American culture, American imperialism. Um, in, I'll say, 1970, when did he move to Manila to go to school? He moved to Manila to go to school. 1967. So first he was an architecture student at Mapua, but he realized he wanted to do fine art. That was, <clears throat> um, he, he was at UP during the first quarter storm, and that's where he was exposed to, you know, uh, he learned about martial law. Like, I mean, it was martial law, so like Chaplin, UP was a hotbed of po uh, political activism. Yeah, before martial law, sorry. Um, and he joined student movements that protested the dictator for the uh, This is this is actually an image that he produced this part later, but in the mid seventies, for Ermita, which was a magazine produced by Boy, published by Boy Chinko. And um, this is a painting called Year of the Dragon. It's part of a series um, on Chinese. Uh, so he met my mom at UP, UP. <laughs> and this is the wedding picture. They were married in 1974, and then they had three daughters, groovy pants, bell bottoms. And uh, so those are my mom's parents, and then those are his parents. Parang yung lolo ko yun. <laughs> all these years, so, um, and in the early 80s, he, I mean, he worked um, in Manila, no? and he decided in the early 80s to go to self-exile, like, tried to um, be an artist in New York City, and then that's where he found his voice in a first world framework. And he was inspired to create the use of indigenous materials. So that in in New York, he also met like artists like Jimmy Durham, who like a Native American artist, who was also doing the same kind of thing. And he realized that you know, like the only distinction between first world artists and um, artists here in the Philippines were that um, ah, the one thing that third world artists had over first world artists was like that niche or like a perspective that really stood out, that people were really looking for um, in the first world. And that's, that's why he was like, well, it's that, like, parang, parang iba, you know. He used indigenous materials, he really parang honed the use of his perspective and his lens um, coming from somewhere else to produce, to work on his art. Uh, in 1986, like his parents died, and uh, Ferdinand Marcos also at the time was overthrown. So, parang it was a new, it's, it was a new environment, this new atmosphere in the Philippines. Everyone was, it was excited. It was like a new beginning for everyone in the country, and so he returned, and he helped found the. Baggy Arts Guild, he continued using the work, I mean, using materials he found only in the Philippines for his paintings and installations, and he started like engaging in his um, immediate communities. So, 
Yeah, and he, he also explored the Zapata at that time. Parang malakas yung anti-US sentiment kasi nga parang were bagong, bagong regime, no? Like, anti-imperialist yung, parang bet na mga, yung political lens ng mga tao. So he explored the effects of colonialism, imperialism, at was he focused on the struggle and the, focused on the struggle of the people in the Cordilleras. Kasi he went back to live in Baguio and he proceeded to create art there and he <clears throat> would go out into, uh, and meet activists such as Father Bowling. So this is a this is a picture from Angel Shaw actually who is here, <laughs> and this is at um, our house in Baguio. He found he helped found the Baguio Arts Guild, and I want to say eighties, eighty eight, eighty seven, yeah. So you can see there's like kid lad the guia the youngers over there is Gary Mamrel boy and girls. Kawaii is a little boy. Angels in the middle. This is for angels. This is your going away party or yeah. That's my dad in the middle. Yeah, Robert. Dave Bananas. I think Ben Cap is in the back with a cup on his head. Yun yung mga artists na parang who built a community in Baguio and um, worked together, collaborated, and kind of enforced the, parang, the art community. Or not enforced, but like um, engaged, huh? established, engaged um, the art community in Baguio. They made it kind of a hub. So everyone was really interested in coming up to Baguio and visiting and seeing what everyone was doing away from Manila. And parang they had their own art practice in Baguio. And it was quiet, it's very clean at the time. And it was just far away from, from the commodity. I always say the commodity of um, art in different centers. So parang it was a very organic place to be producing art. And they just did what they wanted, apart from uh, a scene, I guess. He always wanted to explore boundaries of what he was doing. So in this one, it's parang the boundaries of art, the boundaries of um, politics, and the boundaries of countries, borders of countries. So this one is, is a performance called Imagined Borders and he went around town and he, he did this, this is in Brisbane, but he also did a performance like this in Baguio where he walked around town um, painting his footprints, well, spray, spraying paint over his feet and walking around um, sidewalks, walking over sidewalks, walking over um, like imagine borders, you know, C says like borders are just in your mind. They don't actually exist, they're just um, set by people. So what happens when you walk over them or disregard them or go through them? And so this work kind of touches on that. Uh, he was also, he also advocated bringing art outside of museums and galleries and he he wanted to introduce it to people who didn't have access to it. Like, so he was a big fan of, um, he always created installations and uh, performances. He made murals. I'm sorry, yeah. Random <laughs> annotator. So that is, if you go back, that's a mural in Sagada, in a uh, schoolhouse in Sagada that he, in 19, that he made in 1981. And this one was a mural outside the building in Santa Domingo Road in Quezon City. That's my older sister, Diwata. So that must have been like 1977. Yeah. And he also mentored, Cisati also mentored many 
many younger artists. Because he's I mean, he was a character, no? Like, many times, nakatawa siya, lahat siya nakatawa. You could never, no one could ever take him seriously. And that was his way of really engaging in community, communicating with other people. Na parang that was his charm. Uh, and parang through that, he was really able to parang touch many young artists. So he mentored, he mentored other artists in Baguio, like Jordan Mongo, Sara Perry, Amaril, but also like, kept in touch and collaborated with artists in San Francisco, like Mel Veracruz is over there, and that's Manuel Ocapas over there, so that's how, you know, he had a lot of different art communities he was engaged with in it. He also traveled extensively to different places in, um, here in abroad, so here he is with Anne Weiser, Teku Bayashi, and Bacolo. And he was, he was really like a big advocate of exchange of ideas, he was always learning, and also trying to uh, push his perspective for other for other people to understand. So. And then in the last years of his life, he really got into the going deep into the psyche of Filipinos, and and um, as he was raised Catholic, and he has a lot of Catholic imagery in his work, and he was raised within, within these parameters. Then he wanted to explore what it really meant to be like Filipino and what like pagan rituals Filipinos practiced and you know one that resonated a lot with him was the use of unting and things. Um, and so he started using that imagery in his work and re kind of painting over these um, so I think like his most powerful works were he was painting over these historical photographs that Americans took of Filipinos uh, and putting these magical, like, anting and ting symbols over them and reimagining them, reimagining our histories and um, representing them in a new way. So. Yeah, like I said, he was super funny. I mean, ng dami ng jokes, like, na, minsan, uh, you know, I don't, one of his favorite favorite things to say was, is it art or is it fart? So not all artists yan. Artist ka ba? <laughs> so, um, we had a very complex relationship with him, though. No? So we didn't live with him. We grew up in Manila. Um, but we would always visit him, like, summers and, and Christmases. Or, you know, he would come down to Manila and we show him. Show That's how he, he was. Lagi nagpapatawa. Kaya niya, susunan yung ulo ko. Tapos, so he, and he always encouraged us to look at things from a specific perspective. So here we're traveling through Vigan. Uh, he gave each of us a camera so we would all take pictures. And we were all going to the same places. You know, but he, he gave us all cameras so we could take pictures of what we saw so we could see how different our perspectives were from each other. I guess that's, that's my, my brief spiel about my dad. Like, if I was introducing him to someone who'd never met him before, yeah, nang, that's, that's my list of what he was like. But. And that's how I process the questions from Patrick. But, you know, uh, with Tesman's, this photo. And this was from 1981, I think. And that's outside his house. Uh, you know, just kind of trying to go back to, I mean, I think he was trying to kind of find this identity, like, I mean, that's not a normal kind of portrait, but I don't know if they collaborate or not, but yeah, <laughs> so, but yeah, it's 31, they're just experimenting and like, you know, doing whatever they want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so thank you, Lil. Uh, it's based on the narrative of, of Lil uh, San, uh, Santi Bose, uh, 
uh, work around three, in a way, three words, no? And uh, Baguio, uh, New York, and, and Manila. Okay, so I'm interested in his relationship with Baguio. Because uh, for, for Santi, Baguio uh, represented uh, American uh, colonialism and imperialism. But it also represented uh, indigenous culture uh, to which he, he was committed in fostering and also in uh, trying to negotiate to uh, transform in, in contemporary art. And then thirdly, Baguio represented for him a new space, some kind of a third space for a community of artists uh, that was rooted in a specific locality but at the same time open to an international network of, uh, of uh, colleagues uh, uh, through the uh, Baguio Arts Festival. So uh, can you talk about his relationship with, with, with Baguio? Yeah, as I said, not only a place of uh, art making but also as a platform for a possible third space uh, for contemporary art. I think, um, you know, I mean, we touched on all of them, no? but um, first of all, like, everyone wanted to go to Baguio, say, Malamig siya, that was, you know, it was a tourist spot. And other ones, um, but they had all the space, because, you know, Malawag pang Baguio, no? and then, uh, so they were able to, in the late 80s, like, take over spaces like the Baguio Convention Center, when they did a festival there. And the daming, you know, they were able to use like the medium for installation, for example. They were able to use like all these huge spaces because, I mean, so much was available to them. They, you know, um, and you know, you know, it didn't hurt. It was a tourist spot. I mean, maganda puntahan, masarap. It was nice to stay in. I think that Baguio also has like an energy and. Parang ang nalure no, for all of us here. So, it's in the mountains and cold, but also close to indigenous peoples. And, you know, my dad was also from Abra. His, originated, his family originated from, so ma malapit din siya to all this. So, parang, nga, it was a more organic space for them to create art. What was his experience in the building of a community of artists? Do uh, uh, you have uh, any memory of that or thoughts about it? Uh, how he helped form the arts group, for instance, and how he developed the uh, uh, festival as a platform? Maybe Peggy? <laughs> Join us. Yeah. How did he, as like a community organizer, I'm interested also in uh, the role of uh, Santi as uh, an organizer of communities uh, uh, as part of his artistic practice. And uh, so I'm interested in how he, he did it with other artists in Baguio. I think, although uh, some of the some of the friends, Baguio artists who are here, can uh, will agree with me. Pero ilum pisan lang yaya na, alin na painting tayo, okay? Ha, in the uh, in the seventies. Tapos um, he would. Teka, ano ba yung oh? So um, in the mid seventies, Pandi Aviado. Um, went to Baguio and started the print workshop. So he also did um, prints and with Laila. No? Um, and then. Yung 80s. Wait. Uh -huh. Parang it was a time for new beginnings. So it was a good time to kind of get people together and yeah. like um, create this group that would <laughs> propel the artists together as a community. Because um, you know at the time, wala, namang, wala internet. Like how 
you know, like everyone was stronger. All the artists were stronger together. Um, they would do like group shows, you know, parang mas malakas. And then um, if one person was invited abroad, they could, you know, say, oh, uh, I'm from Baguio, and then they would name, like parang, you know, um, parang it helped everyone elevate each other. So parang art communities in the late 80s and early 90s were really big kasi nga, I know that was the best way to get known outside of your community. So, parang, and I think that helped, but also, parang, syempre, if you are, like Santi was, uh, a curious mind and, you know, someone who was always wanting to engage with other people and learn more about other art practices, you also wanted to go out and, you know, like, be part of other things and learn about other people, learn about other cultures. So, parang, it's just a cycle that you want to learn more, you want to express yourself, parang, that was the motivation and the, parang, that kept everyone going. The, the other site is uh, Manila, no? uh, specifically UP, and in one of his essays in Baguio Graffiti, uh, he, he says, and I quote, the UP was a valuable experience in re-educating myself. Uh, having gained glimpses of what it meant to be Filipino, I began to uh, began to question why I would sing White Christmas in the uh, sweltering heat of Manila. So uh, what was the experience of uh, uh, Santi in UP? Do you have recollection of uh, his, uh, uh, his days in UP? Was he an activist? Was he part of uh, an organization of uh, artists? Or was he part of a certain movement? Yeah. I think at that time everyone was considered an activist in UP, but he was not a member of any of those, um, like Kabataan Mahabayan. But what he did, together with his friends who are here, were Sina Sinoli Galande and um, Bimba Caldas. They um, put up available like movement uh, photography group. And then, um, the, yung kasing time namin sa UP noon, when, when students met, we would discuss ideas and like mostly political um, ideas. So I think that also helped. And then we'd buy books about um, communism, socialism, something like read that, and then talk about it. Maybe the last site is, is New York, no? and this is a bit of a, a gray area in the, in the history of, uh, in the art history of, of Santi, of uh, what, whom he met in, in, in New York and what he did in New York. And, uh, for instance, I know that he was in touch with Jimmy Durham, and in fact, uh, Jimmy Durham wrote a piece on uh, on, on Santi that's anthologized in uh, spirit to Santi. No? So I was wondering uh, if you have any recollection or thoughts on, on, on Santi's stint in, in New York. And this is quite interesting because New York is, an, is you know, it also signifies America and the center of art. And at the same time, he was committed to the critique of America. So how uh, was, was there tension between uh, a certain political um, perspective on America and his presence in America itself? I think, as with all, I think actually he spent in New York, feeling God is the reason why he, his work has a lot of connection for Phil Adams and immigrants. Because, of course, you live in a country that you you were educated to believe na, ano, parang, I mean, you, that you know from your education, uh, committed all these atrocities in the Philippines, and you know, like, you're, uh, you're struggling under the weight of, like, uh, American colonialism. But at the same time, you know, he was there during martial law. It was there that he could express himself as politically, diba, and like, against the regime, the Marcos regime, 
parang di ba napaka yung the juxtaposition of those two things is a like a conflict for him pero and you know the myth, the mythology of New York because he had to leave suddenly um, it grew bigger in his mind but at the same time parang it didn't I think in his later years it didn't seem like he ever wanted to move back to the states parang parang he he liked to see it as his foil I think and was fascinated by and then and maybe that was he had reconciled the idea that uh, he had reconciled himself with the idea that it was not the place that he was going to be living in but it was he had to live with it you know as a, as a country as a mythology you know? yeah. he was in touch with uh, migrants no Filipino migrants as well as uh, Native Americans? Yes. Is, is, is that true? Yes. Well, so uh, one thing about, na hindi masyadong alam about my dad is, uh, yung, so he grew up in Baguio. Yung tito niya was actually a manong who was a foreman for all of those uh, Filipino farm workers who came to the United States and migrated there. So um, yung tito niya who uh, came back to Baguio, made a lot of money um, doing working in the fields in in San Francisco, came back to Baguio, made a lot of money, bought like a lot of land. But you know, you know, he knew all these stories uh, of America also from his Tito. Na, and you know, he had a series on Manos. And parang, when he went to the States, he, uh, he spoke with Manos, he did a series on them, and uh, identified with uh, the older generation of Filipino Americans who uh, lived in the United States uh, and were other like all their lives also so parang that will re also really resonated with him so thank you Lynn and uh, I think uh, for the last part of this conversation we can take questions from from the uh, floor uh, Lynn will be happy to, <laughs> to take, answer us yeah my, my question for you, Deba. <laughs> he was deflecting this. Thing. So I thought, Patrick, why were you interested in curating this series for my dad? I mean, I'm very grateful. I'm very happy to see your, your lens on his work. And I, I just wanted to ask you that. Yeah. Yes, I have been delaying the, <laughs> this, yeah, this response. Uh, but I'm interested basically as uh, an art historian. Uh, so I want to bore, I want I won't bore you with uh, art historical stuff, but uh, just my interest in uh, Asante's, uh, the, the evolution of uh, Asante's artistic language from abstraction to uh, his um, relationship with image and how image becomes part of the picture and how the picture is in turn uh, disfigured through uh, all sorts of techniques like uh, collage, uh, uh, image transfer, and so on and so forth. Of course, intermedia is an uh, important aspect of that. Uh, uh, yeah, this idea of transfer of image and the production of the picture. So, that one, that's one aspect. And secondly, uh, also, um, Maybe uh, an early contemporary practice uh, that was uh, rooted in a particular locality but also invested in an international context. No? So I was interested in that kind of uh, uh, art world formation in, in Baguio and of course in solidarity with uh, uh, communities uh, in Baguio as well as in uh, United States. Eh? So, uh, yeah, among others, I mean, those two uh, interested me in, in the work of Santi. Uh, I was with Santi in uh, an exhibition called uh, Cien Años Cien Años Después, or 100 Years Later, in 1998. It was an exhibition organized by uh, Spain. That was uh, to commemorate the year when Spain lost all of its colonies, uh, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. 
so it was called the disaster, El Disastre, no? In, uh, Spanish. in Spanish history, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, so I was with him in Badajoz, in Extremadura, in in Spain, which was the, I mean close to the close to Portugal. So we we were there for the exhibition uh, curated by Kevin Powell, who was a good friend of Manuel Ocampo, and Manuel Ocampo was part of the exhibition with. Alfredo Esquillo and uh, Imelda Cajete and I. So the show uh, went to uh, Valencia, I think, from Badajoz. It went to Valencia and then finally to the CCP. Yeah, so that was my, uh, I mean, one of my anecdotes on, on Santi. So we can now open the floor no, for the last remaining minutes of this, you know, 15 minutes of Q&A from, uh, from, from the floor will be good, no? Yes, anyone? the same year, 1976. I just want to know, it seems like Santi was the, the person who was making a world, a world maker. Yeah. And I, so, I just want to know his legacy. Because you were saying, it's time that we should follow you, nominate you for the National Artist Award. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hard for me to answer that. I'm his daughter, you know, Shepra, I believe that he should have everything. But <laughs> I mean, just from my personal, like what I learned from him was beyond, I mean, okay. um, I mean, just in terms of, um, so as a writer, as a journalist, he taught me how to um, use my voice, to find my voice, to um, write what I know, and listen to listen and observe you know, everything that's going on around me and go beyond what you know and imagine worlds so but uh, to me uh a per, as a personal legacy that's beyond you know growing up with these images in your house or going to uh, other countries like every time i go to uh, an art space where my dad was known people talk to me about him and say oh my gosh i knew your dad he uh uh, changed my life. He made me see like what was possible for me as an artist, or as a as a Filipino American, or you know, as a person who was living in Hong Kong. And I'm gonna have all those stories. And so to me, that's invaluable and something I want to pass down to my kids. And I mean, I also hope now when people look at his work now, they're able to imagine like these, like what they could do. I know, you know, one thing that I forgot to mention is the para. Uh, my dad struggled financially you know, see that he, he didn't sell a lot of work when he was um, alive and practicing his art and he didn't have a lot of money a lot of the time so i think young use of indigenous material uh was a was a direct um i mean that's why he used indigenous material he, aside from the fact that he didn't want to be beholden to western standards he also wanted to, he, he made do with what he had and what was freely available to him. So we use of Bruno in his work. Um, uh, there's a time that he was painting with solar, solar art, no? para, para things that were available and not expensive to buy so he could continue to express himself and create art. I mean, that's just very Pinoy, you know? Tapos, uh, aside from that, but um, he also made do with like his physical limitations. So, the economic limitations, he, he used whatever materials he could. But the physical limitations, yeah, where um, he had a stroke when he was 42, and then it ruined his left eye. So, parang din siya So, if you look at, and I think that's what I appreciate about the show, is when you look at his earlier work, you can find details of his drawings and his prints, and then, 
um, after 1992, his works expanded. Kasi hindi na siya makikita masyado. He was, he was freely using um, materials like assemblage or you know, photo transfer. Kasi yung mga maliliit na bagay, hindi na, hindi na niya nakita. He just went bigger. He said, well, I can't see too well or I can't work with this. You know, I'll just go with, work with what I have and like, go bigger. It, you know, work well for it. It's a difficult question to answer, Judy. But yeah, but uh, I think you, you said it. Uh, it's, uh, Santi was a world maker, and that's an important legacy, uh, a kind of world making that was uh, rooted in uh, a certain extensive locality. It's not uh, like localism or uh, regionalism in a, uh, like um, an exotic way, no? but uh, a, uh, a kind of uh, extensive locality that was uh, that, didn't, that was able to transcend the local global uh, binary. No? So for me, that's an important legacy. Also, his legacy in uh, the expansion of the post-colonial archive, I think, is important. The uh, in terms of imagery and technology, uh, how images would be combined or coupled together to produce uh, uh, pictures or to produce uh, forms. Um, of course, this is not entirely new, but the, uh, the, there is high, a high level of idiosyncrasy in the, and also humor, no? in the production of, of, this, of this form. And yeah, those two, I think, uh, quickly, come to mind uh, in response to, to, to Judy's question about, about legacy, yeah. Mm. yeah. And maybe uh, this is Sante's last painting. Uh, maybe we can talk about it as we, uh, you know, spring towards the last part of this uh, conversation. Can we talk about this particular work, maybe Peggy and uh, Lynn or Mutia? I don't know. <laughs> well, so, uh, no, um, we were, I guess in a way, kind of lucky that the day before my dad died, there was a video film, film crew um, interviewing him. Because uh, so he died in 2002. So December 2, siya namatay. December 1, a video crew was interviewing him for a documentary on Rob, Roberto Villanueva, who's also an artist from Baguio. And, um, so he was showing them his work. They, this is based on Guernica, uh, kind of thing. And he was talking about this work as the return of the combat, like his 9-11, 9-11 piece. So it was after 9-11, but uh, the Americans started coming back to the Philippines, but uh, to say they were trying to target the terrorist cells in the, in the Philippines. But, uh, so he unearthed all this history on, yeah, of the Americans in the Philippines. So he found these pictures of um, Americans with Filipinas in the side that was, you know, transferred it onto the image of Guernica because that's Picasso's big um, work on war and in the Statue of Liberty. So parang tapos Guernica's black and white, pero sabi niya war is never black and white and that in gray areas. So he was explaining this to the video crew. And then uh, yun, but he died the next day. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Uh, the day before he, he passed away. Okay, and Peggy, maybe you can talk about this painting. Nothing to add. Okay, so maybe we have time for one last quest, one question before we we open the exhibition. Yeah? I think people are excited to to see the show. So maybe that one more question. Isa a question. Isa a question. Yeah, 
because I look at this uh, project as a series, no? so this is the first of the series. I wanted to begin with uh, an exhibition that talks about uh, the artistic language of, of Santiago Bosio. No? So I so I parsed that language into pieces, abstraction, object, archive, treatment of surface, and also uh, <coughs> relationship with ornament. No? So I didn't want to, uh, I want to delay the uh, a certain assumption about Santi. Santi has always been thought to be like, you know, almost seen quite uh, in shorthand as you know, this artist from Baguio, this artist who deals with uh, uh, critique of uh, colonialism, of and thing and thing and so on and so forth. I want, I wanted to delay uh, that uh, the confirmation of that assumption and uh, let the language play out first. Because before Santi could produce that, he was uh, committed to a vocabulary of of techniques. No? So this is what we uh, we see in this exhibition, the horizon of the artistic language of, of Santi. Yeah, there will be, uh, I don't know how many more exhibitions after this, but uh, it will be uh, more than one, no? yeah. <laughs> to be sure. Yeah. So I think I uh, want that. Uh, So our audience from Instagram Live, Alexandra Seno, has a question for you, Dil. <laughs> um, what is it? How would Santi want us to read his work today? That was her question. I think, ano siya po mo siya, di ba? Who's modern siya. So he used of the idea na, however you saw it, was a valid viewpoint um, for his work. But I think also, I mean, because my mahilig siya sa technology, no, my dad. Uh, tapos every day, nung buhay pa siya, he would always text us Arab jokes. Shakana. So, para I think in the age of Facebook and Instagram, para I think you can you can see para pag inongkat mo yung mga work, para Marami ka pa rin maukuha. And I think, if, you know, it's kind of, like, if you, I think he would want you to look at it and para investigate for yourself. See what you can find and see what, I mean, hanggang ngayon, I mean, I look at his work and I saw Robert Frost in, uh, in that self-portrait. I'm like, I've seen that, like, for 30 years. Hanggang ngayon, ngayon ko lang nakita. So, you know, you will keep finding things. So that's, I think, and I think that constant curiosity about his work and a constant investigation of what, what is behind it would be the best way to look at it. Thank you. I think on that note, we'd like to thank the, for, for everyone to, for coming and listening to this conversation. to invite you to the opening uh, of the exhibition in uh, maybe three minutes. We'll just fix this uh, hall and then we're ready to open the exhibition. So thank you once again.